Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our first cross-culture seminar of 2022. My name is Gracie, and it's great to see you all today. I'd like to welcome those of us who are joining online as well. Thank you for tuning in. Um, as you may know, the Young Family Ministry was established to empower parents as the primary disciple makers of their children. One of our goals is training parents with the knowledge and skills on how to nurture their children's faith development. The topics that we have covered last year are discipleship training, how to talk about sex to your children, and how to bring our kids to salvation. If you happen to miss one or some of those seminar and would like to have copies of the materials, please get in touch with one of us and we'll be very happy to assist you with that. For today, we are delighted to have Brett Ryan, CEO of Focus on the Family Australia to with us again. Um, it was a great blessing to have him uh, with us last year discussing on how to bring our kids to salvation. This afternoon, um, it is our privilege to have you, Brad, um, helping us with the topic of discipline and discipleship. Please note that throughout the talk, if you have any question, you can um, send us a question to this number that we put it on the whiteboard over there, also now shown on screen. Um, if you are um, joining us via Zoom, you can also see that phone number in the chat as well. And now it is my great pleasure to welcome Brad. Um, everyone, would you please join me in welcome him? Brad, before our talk, can we just quickly ask you a few questions, um, sure. especially for those Any who questions? haven't? <laughs> uh, could you please tell us a bit about yep, <laughs> a bit about yourself, your family, and um, your ministry is focused on the Family Australia. I'll go through it in my introductions. I'll I'll share all that uh, in the beginning. Um, so I'll talk about my family in just a few moments because I wait for all those people uh, coming in on time. You know, like, and uh, and then we'll and then I'll also talk about focus on the ministry as well. Yes, thank you so much. Um, well, then in that case, you know how we just um, had a quite a number of long weekends just passed, and many of us um, with families have taken advantage of having a, a couple of family holidays. Uh, for yourself, is there any memorable moments that you know you could always recall about a family holiday that you have had? Well, I had the privilege of taking my sons, my three sons, to America, and we went to an NBA game. We also went to Disneyland, uh, and then I had another opportunity of taking my boys to Europe, and we went to Italy, we went to France, and, uh, and I said, what's your favorite holiday destination? Wanting to find out what it was all about, and they said, Phillip Island. And I, I could have saved a lot of money, and... Uh, and, and I said, why, why Phillip Island? It is our favorite holiday destination. But they said, why Phillip Island? They said, because it had a table tennis table and we were just hanging out together and we got ice creams every day. So there's some keys. Phillip Island, overseas, not too far away. <laughs> Make sure there's a table tennis table and go out for ice cream. Key for a healthy family. <laughs> Noted. Thank you, Brad. Um, before your talk, um, I would like to pray, if that be okay. Thank you. Dear loving Heavenly Father, thank you for the redemption that you have graciously poured out to us through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for our children as they are gifts and rewards from you. We thank you not only for the countless blessings that you have given to our families, but also for the challenges that draw us near to you. We desire to bring our children up with the dis discipline and instruction that come from you, to train them up in the way that they should go. Even when they are old, they will not depart from it. So we pray, Lord, that you may speak to us through bread today and help us to better understand what it means to discipline our children and how we can make sure that we are discipling our children as we discipline them. May bread be filled with your wisdom and peace, Lord. And for those of us who are listening, may our hearts be prepared to learn and to love your words and by your grace, applying them into our daily lives. 
In the name of our Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So what time are we finishing? Is it four o'clock? So four o'clock? <laughs> well, I have to say, I've, I really enjoyed preparing for this message. I haven't given this particular one before. And so I spent nearly all day Friday just doing the preparation. But I've listened to about 15,000 million podcasts. Plus, I got up early at five o'clock this morning because I had an idea in my brain and I had to get out. Then I went to the gym and I got back and then I had to prepare some more. So I'm just telling you that there's been a lot of heart and soul in this, but I hopefully that you will benefit greatly from what I have to share with you. And ultimately, you, you can have the opportunity to ask those questions, the, the burning questions. And obviously the big one, I've already been told, can you smack your kids? So you'll have to just wait Wait before I share the big reveal. All right. Now, uh, we were asked about my family. I've got three sons and they're all married. I am an empty nester. And uh, so this is uh, Taylor and, and uh, Sylvia. And I actually mentored her from about 12 to about 15. And at that stage, she was a very impressive young lady. Very impressive. And I said to my wife at that time, I said, I think I found the girl for one of our boys. And uh, they had never met. And uh, so I went up to her mother and I said, do you believe in arranged marriages? And she said, if it's one of your sons, yes. So fast forward another 10 years, they finally met and the rest is now history. Uh, then we've got Lachlan and Brasida and, uh, and then Cam, our baby, got married in December. So we've had two COVID weddings. And, uh, and, but the beauty of it is they've um, given me, Taylor and Sylvia, two grandchildren. And Lachlan and Brasida, number three, is on its way in July. So I know I can't, I can't, I'm too young to be a grandparent, but I love the title of Pa. It's just amazing. So that's a bit about uh, my journey is uh, I've been married for 32 years and uh, I was a critical care nurse for 15 years, then a pastor for 12 years at City Life Church. And now I've been at Focus for nine years. And uh, so we get to go all over the country talking about healthy families, healthy relationships, do things on the radio, which were incredibly, it's an incredible ministry. Uh, we're in about 750 radio stations across Australia. And so our voice is heard in all sorts of places and uh, people don't think I'm really who I am because I think that I must look like something else. I don't know why they're a little bit disappointed when they see me. So I apologize. This is what I look like, but focus uh, has got a variety of different things, a, a website, and I can give you all this information. You can download lots of things, uh, weekly tips, and I can give you a, 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 a QR code in just a few moments time. And by all means, feel free to photograph any of these um, slides that will give you um, some benefit for us. Um, but the probably the most exciting thing um, that we've, we've got, I'll share in just a few moments, but you can find out how you're going as a parent by taking a parenting assessments to find out areas of strength and maybe some areas of growth. Uh, then you can do the same thing with your marriage. Uh, we've also got a whole video series for free about mental health and well-being and anxiety, um, a parenting course for early parents, uh, you know, like the one to fours and then for the primary age school. Um, we did another three-part series on that. Um, for your marriage, caring, conflict, and, and um, communication conflict. The sexuality maze, which is a big one, and how to talk to your kids about some of the, uh, um, the transgenderism, uh, some of the pornography, sexuality. Um, there's a, a number of different things. Anyway, I, I won't bore you with all these things, but I, I, I would like to let you know that our website has got a wealth of a treasure trove of different resources. Um, but the most exciting thing that we've got at the moment is not only have we, we've got a, a free uh, devotion that you can do download with your children and um, they can do it goes for about a month of different things and then if you like you can subscribe to that so that's available on our website together devotions um, but we've also created um, a platform and you can get some brochures around here later on on family cast and it's all been made available for free um, because of people who support the ministry and we just we used to put a fee on it and we thought you know what we want to make a blessing to churches to schools um, whoever individuals 
that can actually be blessed. And all those videos um, on how to fight your way to a better marriage, there's stuff for kids called the Adventures in Odyssey. Um, there is everything that you could ever want. And the other thing we're just doing at the moment is um, uh, an online marriage conference. And uh, we're, we're actually coming to an end of the, the one that's coming. We've had about 800 couples doing that in the last couple of years. Um, but there's another one starting in July. So just stay note of that. Um, you can go to our website for all of that information. And because you've got your phones there ready to go, um, a QR code, everyone's very familiar with QR codes. If you'd like to sign up for a newsletter, I do a weekly tip and it's about a minute to read or a minute to listen to. Um, and then a monthly one that has different ideas. And you can just sign up uh, through that. And so it's all just marriage, parenting, and life advice through a biblical worldview. So that's all available for you. And, uh, and I appreciate that that will be a blessing to you. So disciple and, discipleship and discipline. This is a, this is a great topic. And I'm, I'm really pleased that I've been invited to speak on this topic. There's so much in it. And hopefully by about four o'clock, we'll have finished. But uh, a verse sort of similar to what in the introduction, children are really are a heritage. They are a blessing and they are a reward. And grandchildren are an even better reward, just letting you know. So those days when you think, I've had enough, just remember there's grandchildren on the way. They are further down the track. But remember, you've got to make the most of every opportunity that you can while your children are so, so young and to continue to shape them and mold them and to become the way that God has designed them to be. But this, I love this, like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. So you're all very young, but you're going to have to prepare these, these children like arrows and you're going to send them out into the world and you have to prepare them, set them up for success. And that takes discipleship, and it takes discipline. But you have to continue to keep the mirror close to your own face about how you are being disciplined and how you are discipling yourself and those around you. So let's get started. This is a great verse that many people refer to. Train up a child in the way that they should go. When they are old, they will not depart from it. This is a proverb, not a promise. This is something that many people parents get mixed up with them. They said, I did everything right. Tick, 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 tick. And their kids chose another path. The prodigals, they've left their faith. And unfortunately, the data is supportive of that. Now you're all here to be proactive. You're all here to try and prevent those children uh, leaving faith, leaving the community, leaving church, leaving their faith altogether. And so the important thing is there is no silver bullets, but I'm going to provide you with some keys, some, some ideas, some guidelines to help you disciple your children and to discipline them growing up in the things of God. But the other aspect of this, train up a child in the way that I want them to be is a wrong thinking. If you want your child to become a certain career or if you want them to be gifted in certain areas, that's how you want them, not how God uniquely designed them. They all come with a unique fingerprint, unique eyes, a unique temperament. Just, they're just so unique and not one size fits all. You wish they did. You wish they honestly did. You have one, two, three children. You think, well, I've, got the, I've done the one, the guinea pigs. Any, anyone here firstborns? Any firstborns? I'll pray for you later on. There's, there's, a whole, there's, a whole, there's a whole lot of research on the birth order. If you find that, if you want to do some fascinating reading about birth order and about how, they, how you're wired, it's not foolproof. It's not necessarily scientific because it's generalized, but the traits are still there. And you have to say, when you have your first child, they were your guinea pig and you make mistakes on them or they're just perfect, whichever, which way you want to do it. Because our first child was angelic. Like you just have to go, yes, mum, yes, dad. Number two and number three, not so much. <laughs> but we had to find out, and they've got a lot of similarities, but they've also so 
so unique. And so in the mindset, when you train them up, you have to find out and be a student of your children to make sure that you're parenting them the way that they should go. You're disciplining them in, in the way that they should go. You're discipling them in the way that they should go. Not because this is the foolproof tick the box mentality. It may have worked for you. It may not have. You might have said other things, and I'll talk about that in a few moments' time. But train up a child on the way it should go. You, you are helping them steer them towards a course of which is their true north in God. So how do we learn how to be a parent? And now, unfortunately, there's, the pendulum can swing both ways. I just thought I would take note. This is really clever, isn't it? I've never done that before, so I thought it was really clever. <laughs> Took me the whole six hours. But anyway, I got it down today. <laughs> Because often the pendulum can swing too far because of our family of origin. You might have been brought up in a family that was very strict, very authoritarian. Authoritarian. Do it my way. Don't speak. You are a child. You can be seen and not heard. So you go, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go the other way. They can have whatever they like. They are in control. And that's what's changing our culture today. Other things that affect our parenting is, you know, our personal experiences, sometimes good, sometimes not so bad, not so good. And then we also get married and then they have a different experience and all of that come together and those different tribes that come together and it can end up being tribal warfare or harmony. Anyone here in tribal harmony? So you're all in tribal warfare. Our culture has a very big, far, uh, big factor to play. And especially if different cultures have a very much more a matriarch or a patriarch in charge of what's going on. And then with the different type of pairs, uh, parenting styles, you've obviously heard of the authoritarian. They're the strict. They are the tiger mums and dads. And if you've ever watched, did you watch the parent guidance? Anyone watch it? I was fascinated that the tiger parents were very, very popular. They were open to learning, but they were very this is the way they're doing. And it was interesting that, I don't know how they view one, but the permissive parenting style became the champions. But I don't think it really was. I think they were looking at the style of parenting and people say, well, I think I should, I should lean a little bit more, being a little bit more uh, uh, permissive, a little bit more uh, flexible, a little bit more allowing the children to have some empowerment. But we don't know, and actually I do know, the outcome of permissive parenting is not good. You're creating very entitled. In fact, I'll go to the next slide. What it actually is changing very much is that you can become overindulged. You can actually become more child-centric, that they're actually filled with um, this entitlement that it's all around them. Forgetting that you were a tribe before the kids arrived. So it's so important that you as parents solidify and not become child focused. Now, I have seen, and again, this is maybe a cultural thing. I actually do see, and this is from my observation, and I apologize for this. I think sometimes in the Asian community, the children become the center of their universe. Now you're nodding, that could either make you feeling, yes, he might be right, or get him out of here. And the children actually become the, the center of attention and everything revolves around them. And what you're doing is if you're training them that way, if you're training that the children have got more say, they become the bosses. They become, they feel that they are socially equal with you, if not above you, if you train them that way. And so that's the important that you need to know how you're training them. They are some keys, which I'll share along the way, but it's in, in vitally important that you as a mother and father ideally are on the same page or as close together on how you're going to bring up this child. Because there's no point of having a good cop, bad cop scenario, because kids will look for the path of least resistance and they'll find a chicken, chink in the armor and they'll go, I can get my way if I nag enough, if I whine enough, if I throw a tantrum enough, or, and there I say it, this is a big one, and this is not just an Asian culture, this is everyone, they embarrass me enough to get their own way. You know what? I would rather you be embarrassed for a little while, but you're in charge, not the other way around. Kids 
will do everything they can to get what they want because they're innately selfish. They are. Let's face it. If they want their nappies changed, they'll cry. All of our, they will make enough noise to make sure that you get their attention. And that progresses. And I have the same thing with my two, two and a half year old grandson. He is so determined. Now he can get away with a lot of things because, well, I'm a grandfather. But I'm noticing a lot more that he is trying to get what he wants. And he's only two and a half and he's got a voice and he's utilizing it. And if he gets what he wants, he will continue to get what he wants. He will continue because they're not training him. And now obviously mum and dad, my son and daughter-in-law are doing a fantastic job. That is not what I'm saying at all. But you know, there's sometimes where he would just go, I don't want you to put me in my chair. Well, you're two and a half, mate. I'm a bit bigger than you. I don't want it. And again, path of least resistance. Sometimes I've actually backed off, but I've actually, even now I'm being more and more determined that I can't allow this two and a half year old to tell me who's going to put him in a chair. But I digress a little bit. But children also can be overprotected. We talk about, um, you heard the expression bubble wrap generation. You've heard about, um, uh, well, helicopter parenting, you know, they hover down. It's called drone parenting now. That's the other, it's, a, it's much more I like that. But you, and, and then there's a new one called lawnmower parenting, which means that you're actually making everything smooth. You don't want any bumps in the road. You're making it very clear. And you're actually doing your child a disservice. If I was actually going to ask you right now, what do you want from your child? What do you want? What do you ultimately want your child? Would you like them to be happy? Anyone? Is that a goal? Is that a goal of yours? You're all failed. <laughs> because if you want your child to continually be happy, what is setting them up for when life doesn't be happy? Now, ultimately, you do want them to be content. You do want them to be fulfilled. You do want them to be responsible. You do want them to be outward focus rather than me focus you do want those and if they find those things to be fulfilled then they may be happy but if my ultimate goal is to make them happy then they will always get what they want i want a mars bar for breakfast sure we want you to be happy see the mind the different mindset so again it's nothing wrong with them wanting to be happy, but if that's your ultimate goal, you're not setting them up for success. You're not training them up for life, which we'll talk about as we progress along life's journey. So the, it's, it's a balance. There is a fine balance. And we'll talk about that. But I love, this, I love this quote, rules without relationship leads to rebellion. Josh McDowell said this, rules without relationship leads to rebellion. So a key of what I'm going to be sharing with you to disciple and to discipline your children is through a relationship. I cannot emphasize enough the relationship that you had with your child. It's not a matter of control because if you go in with the mindset, you do what I'm telling you to do and you want to control the, you know, the conversation and control their actions, control their behaviors, control everything, there's no relationship. I've never heard a, a wife come up to me and say, you know what? I really, really love my husband. I really know my husband loves me because he controls me. No one never says that. And the child will be the same thing. They know that you love them, not because you control them, but because you have a relationship with them. And we're going to go and give you, provide some methods to actually have that healthy relationship with your kids in order for you to disciple them and order to discipline them. All right. So there's a balance. I talked about balance and I asked my boys about where they thought that I rated when I came to parenting and they actually came down to these things, fun, firm, and fair. Now I can be the fun guy, but I also had to be, I had to sometimes be firm with them, but I had to be fair. When you become unfair, it's like your boss. If you had your boss and he was always, always firm on you, always on your case, everything about you, did, you couldn't do anything wrong, you would say that is not fair. 
If you have an environment, and I actually worked at a place where um, you weren't, uh, this is when I was about 15, 16 years of age. And uh, we were, we were, it was in a factory floor and I just had a part-time job during the school holidays. And we were told we were not allowed to talk at all. And it was seriously, you, we were got into trouble. Like there was no laughter, no fun, no thing. It's not fair. So I would say that the environment that you want to create in your household is to have some fun, to build that relationship intimately into your family dynamics. At times you need to be firm, but it has to be fair. It has to be reasonable. Because sometimes we can overreact. Any, any overreactors here, anyone? No overreactors. I see a little hand now. We'll have an altar call for you lying people out there as well. The word disciple, and it's, uh, looking at the, this is fantastic. And for that, I'll, I'll put in both if you want to take it. It comes from the same root word. So discipline and discipleship are hand in hand. One means to be a student or a learner or a follower. And the other one, discipline, becomes, it's it, it's same, same meaning, to be either a pupil or a student. It has the same aspect. And when we talk about disciple, it was actually to follow somebody, is to follow a, a, a someone worthy of. And it was actually the Christians that actually became the first disciples. We can always put discipleship with just Christianity, but there's a lot of discipleship. There's gurus everywhere across this nation. But we want our children to become disciples of the living God, our heavenly father. But it's going to take discipline. And you have to be a good follower yourself and a good teacher. My favorite verse in the Bible when it comes to parenting is this. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And then it goes on to these commandments I give you today. Impress them upon your own, impress them on, have it on your own heart first, and then impress it upon your children. So you've got a role and responsibility to impress them. Are you someone who is being impressive? Is there something about you that your kids want to aspire to? Growing up, you probably had those those role models, those people that you want to aspire to. If you were to, if your children, if I actually had an opportunity to speak to your mum and uh, your children, and I go to say, hey, do you want to be like your mum and dad? And they go, no. Nah. Now they might say that just because they're kids. But if I delve a little deeper, are you someone worthy of following to be impressive and especially when it comes to your faith is it real is it genuine is it authentic and then it becomes a lifestyle talk about it when you're sitting at home when you walk along the road when you lie down it is a lifestyle and all of that to say as you discipline your children as you disciple your children it can't just be on Sundays to make you look good amongst your family and your friends. It is a 24-7 opportunity to, to be real in your own faith and in the balance of being firm, fun, and fair. And also, obviously, to not create a, a wedge or a tension where your relationship is. And the scriptures talk about this very often when they talk about, you know, uh, children, obey your parents or honour your parents. That's a, that's a huge undertaking. But are you someone worthy to be obeyed? Are you someone to be respected? Are you someone to be honoured? Again, are you an impressive person? Love this verse where it talks about fathers, but you can incorporate this into parents. Do not exasperate or pick on your kids or make them, you know, to frustrate them, to, to annoy them. Now, I have to say, I, I am a work in progress when my boys were growing up, I have to say. Being a critical care nurse, I majored in intensive care and accident emergency. So for me to have a really good day, someone had to have a really bad day. So when my boys hurt themselves, little scuff on the knee, you'll be right. They'll be crying. <laughs> I would get the giggles. I, 
my wife would send me to my room until I got my act together. Because I didn't get as much sympathy because their bones weren't sticking out from their leg or their, you know, some blood was coming out of some orifice somewhere along the line. But it goes on to say, train them up in the instruction of the Lord. That is our responsibility. All throughout the scriptures, you have an incredible responsibility to do this. Well, you have the first voice privilege and you cannot outsource this. You can't give it to the church. You can't send it to a Christian school. You can't give them to somebody else to do it. You have that first voice privilege and you need to maximize that opportunity. So we need to role model our own faith. We need to role model those things that make sure that You are someone to be worthy of being followed. Worthy, basically, you your children are becoming your disciples, and you disciple you're following God. So they're they're getting a first glimpse of what a real disciple is. Are you role modeling this to your own children? Because you can't just say, read your Bible if you're not reading the Bible. You can't just say pray and you're not praying. You can't say you should serve in the local church if you're not serving in the local church? Do you go to a small group if you want your kids to go to a small group? Everything you do is being watched. You're being observed. You're you're under the microscope a lot of the time and they're they're watching and observing. Are 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 you the real deal? The more that you can do that, the far, far better it will be. Excuse me for a moment just to... So, how do you become... A role model to your kids. Well, it starts off. Are you obedient to your parents? Do you honor your parents? Do you speak about them positively? Are you obeying God's rules and decide in your in your journey? Are you following His word? And you want them to. You want to have your own faith owned. You want your kids to own their own faith and become more Christ-like. All these things. Are you somebody? that is going to role model what a Christian looks like. That's in your language, your tone, your attitude, your behaviors, all of these things are being watched and observed to role model your own faith. To disciple your kids is no, it's, it's, a, it's ongoing. It's never just once off. The more real and more authentic you can actually show your kids, the kids will more follow, they'll follow. So no guarantees. But it's a start. Now, I love this verse where it comes in from Hebrews. My son, do not regard, this is you and I, lightly uh, uh, regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. For the Lord disciplines those he loves. If you want to show love to your kids, you need to discipline them. But you discipline in love, not in anger, not in frustration. It's for discipline that you have been to endure. God is treating you as sons and daughters. That's what he's really got. For for what son is, is there whom his father does not discipline? We have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Now, you might have not thought that you liked everything your parents did for you. Anyone really love everything your parents did to you? Anyone? We've got probably a mum here. It, you, can, you can say that's truthfully. You can, you're holding your hand. So it's just, I don't know if it's just so you're ready to go through a throat or not. But you respected them, maybe not at the time, but this is where it goes. For the moment, all discipline seems painful. It's just, it is, it's painful. It's painful. It's relentless to do this consistently and everything like that. It's not pleasant. And your kids aren't going to say, oh, thank you, mummy and daddy. I appreciate your discipline. It is so pleasant for me to be disciplined. And I know that I will have a fruit of righteousness as a result, as you train me in the way that I should go. At the time, no, it is not that way inclined at all. But you do reap the harvest. When I was talking about, and again, this is not trying to blow my own trumpet, but uh, when my boys write in a birthday card or a Father's Day message, and they say things, if I am half the man that you are, I will be a very happy man man if i love my spouse like you love mum i'll be a very happy man if i parent like you 
And then my boys actually created a video series uh, for me. Uh, and I don't know if I mentioned this last time about the three amigos. And at the end of that, they just go into little bits of what it means, what it means for me to be their father. And I tell you, I was a blubbering mess. But it just it re-emphasized that I was I was role modeling, far from perfect, and they're not asking or expecting you to be perfect. If we actually go and compare and contrast and see what everyone else is doing, you'll always be frustrated. But if you want to love your children, it takes the importance to discipline them, but you discipline them God's way, not the way of this world. And we'll talk about that as we go along. Another verse very similar to this in Proverbs, my child, don't reject the Lord's discipline and don't be upset when he corrects you. No, for the Lord corrects those he loves, just as a father corrects a child whom he delights. So just like we don't want to, we sometimes, maybe, maybe going back to that family of origin, maybe the things that your parents did to you upsets you. So as a result of that, the pendulum swung a little bit too far and you want your children to always like you. You don't want them to be mad at you. We want them to, you know, be our best friends, BFFs. If you go on with that mindset, in fact, if your kid likes you all the time, you're probably doing something wrong. I'll say that again. If your kids like you all the time, you're probably doing something wrong. There are going to be times when they're not going to like you, but if you do it with the balance of being fun, firm, and fair, and do it with an out of relationship, they will then ultimately respect you. They may not like you, but they will respect you. And we'll go on a little bit more about this. So here are some things about discipline that I think may be worth noting. Discipline is not punishment. It's not punishment. And I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, there's another slide coming up about the difference between discipline and punishment. But I thought I'd just start with this. Discipline is not punishment. It is more of a training. It's a more of a, a forethought. It's being proactive, not reactive. Because punishment sometimes happens there and then. And there's incredible opportunities to teach and equip your children to think differently. Any mums know this? It's never convenient when you're at the shopping center and they threw their tantrums. <coughs> Anyone had one of those? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> My wife, our boys were throwing a tantrum at a supermarket. And she said, if you throw a tantrum at the supermarket, we're going to go home. And we won't have any food in the house, but we're going to go home. The kids threw a tantrum. So she stopped. She said to the checkout ladies, and she says, I'm really sorry. Can you, I, I've got to leave this here because the kids are losing it. And I said to them, they're going to throw a tantrum. Not very convenient. I'm going to have to leave this here. And they all said, go for it, girl. Good on you. <laughs> Wish it could be more parents like that. Because what we tend to do is, hey, you're embarrassing me, this tantrum. Um, what can I do to placate you? And guess what you go to? Technology. I want my, I want my, I want my screen. I want it. I'll tell you what. If I did a presentation on technology and you can invite me back if you want, you may not want me back again after this. Uh, technology is a big, big thing. Um, uh, and, and one of the things is that we tend to use technology as a babysitter and it is wrong, it's bad. It's so bad. If you want your child to be more and more entitled, continue to give them the technology. Just give it to them. They will continue to, they will, they will love it. They will love it because it's easy, it's entertaining, and, and it takes less work on you. But you're actually creating the me monster. You're actually giving, and I heard this expression, your technology is like giving them Goliath. This access to this big, bad world. And it's very hard to defeat the big, bad world unless you become and equip your children with stones to know how to fight it. And unfortunately, they don't want it because Goliath looks really fun. Goliath looks awesome. Goliath looks, and unfortunately, we're finding a losing battle. So next time you put your technology into your child's hands, watch and think of me. 
don't do it. It's easy. It's the path of least resistance. And I get it. I understand. There are times when you just need a break. But if you default to that every time, they will always want it every time. Because you're, guess what? You're training them up. If they whine enough or they complain enough or they just want to get, uh, they just annoy you enough, guess what? You give in. Here's the technology. Get off my back. Be quiet. You're training them up and they will continue to do what they get until they get it unless you take control. But I'll talk about that in another thing. And there's actually a video series on talking to your kids about technology and social media on, our, on that video series. Um, needs to be age appropriate and effective. Now, not every child works. As I said, my eldest child, you have to go, no, Taylor, no. That's all he needed to do. Whereas it wasn't that effective when you said that to the other two. I'll talk about that age appropriateness a bit later on. A key, a key to all this, don't discipline when you're angry because you'll say something or do something that will do damage. It will harm the relationship. And I can bet you if I unpacked and had a little conversation with you a little bit longer and I would, can guarantee that you remember incidents with your parents when they were angry more than when they were just loving and caring and fun and just being wanting to be with you you'll always remember the times when you experience true anger we shouldn't do that with our kids you can still be angry but don't discipline at that time you can say i am really angry right now i just need to i need to calm down i need to i need to get my act together and we're going to talk about this in a moment half an hour we'll regroup now, if you really want to annoy your kids, go to 32 minutes. Those extra two minutes can really do, because they're going to be looking. <laughs> Don't ever discipline in, in, the, in the moments. Better to remove yourself and control it. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But you need to explain to your children what you expect and why you expect it. And we might do, you might be thinking some questions and some in the Q&A for that. Just I'll come back to those, some examples if you want to have some. And it doesn't have to be you. It can be, say, my friend or, or I know somebody who's got this issue. But you need to make sure that you explain the why. And if you, I mean, let's face it, if your kids don't know what you expect of them, they will fail because you're setting them up for failure. If you just suddenly burst out and you say, yeah, you should have done this. You didn't tell me I needed to do that. I, you should have known. You didn't tell me. Remember, they are children. They're not adults. Even adults don't always, if you're employees or, you know, people you work with, you think, this is so, this is so obvious. Why doesn't anyone do this? They're adults. Children, they're children. Got to think with the mentality of children. All right. So what's your preferred future? I love, and I just got a couple of verses of, you know, where there is no vision, the people will perish. When people do not accept divine guidance, they will run wild. Wherever there's no revelation, you as parents provide a vision. You provide divine guidance. You provide them a revelation of how to live life. So what is your preferred future? What is the guidance? What is the goal in mind? Going back to that thing, if you want your children to be happy, just give them chocolate every day. They'll be very happy. It might be great for the outcome long term. If you want your children to be self-centered and it's all about me, continue to give whatever they want. You are training them up. You are giving them a vision of their, it's all about me. That's their vision. But if you're saying, hey, I don't, I am actually wanting you to become independent, free thinkers. Now, you don't say that to a eight-year-old, but you can say this to a 16-year-old. I want you to be independent. I want you to be wise. I want you to make wise choices. I want you to make decisions that affect you. I can't control that any longer. But if I continue to protect you, if I continue to not um, give you any responsibility, if I continue to do all these things, I am not preparing you for your future. I am not preparing you to be a husband. I'm not preparing you to be a wife. I'm not preparing you to be a husband or a fa father, sorry, a father or a mother. I'm not preparing you to be a work 
because otherwise the kid's going to say, well, you know, my mum always loved everything that I ever did, even if it wasn't very good. And they go to work and they do their bare minimum and they wonder why the boss doesn't love them. They wonder why they, they don't get a promotion. They wonder why, you know, you don't thank them for turning up an extra 15 minutes earlier or 15 minutes later. It's because we're fed them. They're very me orientated and you have an opportunity to change the directory. And in this room alone, you can change the culture of the next generation. And I will have to say, I would love for you to train up your children to be counter culture. I know you're cross culture, to be counter cultural. <laughs> to be cross, uh, you know, to, to not follow the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of their mind to think and act and to stand up for what they believe in, to stand up for righteousness. Even if it's against what the flow of the traffic and everyone else is saying, they can stand up for themselves because I can guarantee you, and I can tell you lots and lots of stories for our boys growing up where they were stood up for their value systems, stood up for their belief systems, and they were admired for it. Simply for standing out rather than blending in. But that's another conversation altogether. So I mentioned about the fact is uh, about the differences uh, of, you know, discipline is what you do for a child, not to a child. So it's the, it's the end result. It's the end result that you're thinking of, not just a punishment is here and now, done, bang. But discipline is actually for them. It's what you're doing into the future. So here's a couple of things that you might find of benefit because punishment is really just a penalty. I'm annoyed. I'm angry. I'm going to get away. I'm going to get you back. I'm going to, you're, you've ticked me off. I'm going to punish you. But with no explanation of what you wanted to, or just out of your frustration and then it doesn't teach them anything. It makes them feel guilty. It makes them feel shame. They'll start getting a seed of bitterness towards you or re resentment towards you. Um, but you never, and this is a big one on this last one here, you don't want your children just to obey you out of simple fear. If they're just doing it just to pacify you or to, because they're scared of the living daylights out of you, I don't, annoy, you know, I, don't, I, I just want to be good so I don't get into trouble. That is not a relationship. And that is not discipline. That is out of fear. Because as soon as they get the chance, as soon as they get the chance not to be under your roof, you've lost that relationship. So again, if you want a healthy relationship with your future grandchildren, have a healthy relationship with your kids now. It's not automatic. But discipline is much more of a training and correction. It's leading to that maturity. It's that responsible, uh, to be responsible. What's it, responsibility? Is it responsibly? I think that's right. Um, it's the future focus. It's actually motivating them. And if you do this well, then they will feel secure. And that security, I'm going to land probably on that one as we go along, uh, talking about this a little bit more. So, so I talk about discipline. I talk about the, it really, it's the boundaries. And there's so many different types of boundaries that our kids have got today. And I just, you know, if you, if you, anyone play sport, you know, you know, playing tennis, there's lines, you know where the boundary is. Is it good staying inside the boundary? Everything can go well, but outside of the boundaries, it leads to consequences. Same with God's word. God's saying, hey, I want you to live, to live your life to its full. That's what John 10, 10, 10 said, or John 10, 10 says. It, to live your, I came so that you may have life to its full. And he's not actually a party pooper. The Bible is not full of rules and regulations of thou shalt nots. It's actually, there's a rules and regulations of guidance of how to live your life to its full. You stay within those boundaries, life can be good, but you step outside the boundaries, there will be consequences. Does that make sense? So if you have, there's certain types of boundaries of behavior expectations in your home. Technology, which we can talk about at another time maybe, um, as your kids getting older, you know, dating, you have to know what they're, this, this types of movies that you might want to allow, the music, you know, these are boundaries that you can have them. Um, expectations around the house, the way that you treat one another, the way you speak. And, and has anyone got any siblings that don't fight at all? Never, ever fight? Never? Anyone here? Kids, kids, basically kids know how to push each other's buttons. And let's face it, they probably know how to push your buttons as well, just because they can. 
and they do it because it's a power trip. I get a bit of a thrill when I annoy my brother and sister. I get an even bigger thrill when I annoy mum and dad. I don't like the consequences, but I do get a little bit of a high when I get them annoyed. Don't give them the satisfaction. On the inside, you're freaking out. On the outside, cool, calm and collected, which we'll talk about in a few moments. But the reason why I was talking about these boundaries is they need to be clear. They need to be concise. They need to have clear consequences and you need to be consistent. And consistency is probably the hardest thing parents find difficult because it takes so much work. It is relentless to try and keep up with it because your kids will continue to push you and push you and push you and you'll go, I'll oh, give up. And that's when they go, okay, I know. I get what I want if I continue to push the right buttons, but you need to be consistent and know what they are. And kids will feel much more secure if they know what the consequences are. And in fact, part of the equation, as your children growing up, they should become part of the solution. If you don't come home at a certain time, what do you think is a reasonable consequence? You might be surprised, and the researcher says, kids that tend to be harder on themselves than you are. Include them in the journey. Explain the reasons why I want you to be home at such and such a time. And it may be simply to say, hey, I don't have a curfew, but I expect you to come home at a reasonable time. You're empowering them to make some decisions. You're empowering them to be responsible. You're empowering them to become ownership of their life not the other way around. If you control everything aspect of their life, eventually they're going to leave the nest and they don't know how to do anything because mum or dad have made every decision they've ever had. So you can start doing this and, and, and this will make a much more sense as we talk about how to build relationships with your kids. Now, first one I'd like to, you know, you should write this down on your fridge, all right? Learn to respond, not react. Response means that you're, you can wait to the next slide and then, and then you can, so you don't have to wait for, otherwise you'd have to take 7,000 photos and this way. But I appreciate your enthusiasm. Learning to respond, not react, meaning that when you respond, you are control of your volume, your tone, your mannerisms, your attitude, everything. When you react, you fly off your handle. That's not discipline. That's just anger. You've probably got more issues that you need to deal with before you can discipline your children. Because if your boss came up and yelled at you, what do you hear? You hear the aggression. You don't really hear everything. But if you're responsive, your boss says, look, I'm really concerned that you're a little bit overloaded at the moment. And you've, um, is there something going on in your world at the moment? That's a response. And if your boss came out, you said, what are you doing? You're dropping the ball. Flight and fright. You just, you'll flee or you'll just fight and you'll become defensive. Same thing with your kids. If you're yelling at your kids, what are you teaching them? You're teaching them that you're not in control. You're losing it. That's one thing you're doing. But you're not teaching them a lesson. You're not giving them preferred future. You're not giving them the expectations. When they drop the ball and they make a mistake, Remember, they're a child, but you're also saying, hey, I need, I need you to know that I see you. I value you. I care for you. What's going on in your world? And you have so much more effectiveness in your discipline if you continue to control your response rather than the reaction. So that's a good place to start. All right, next one. Listen more, lecture less. We can go into our monologues and our kids are going to go, I can see their lips moving. I tuned out about 10 minutes ago. And you're going to say, look at me, look at me, look at me. And they're going to go, and they're looking straight through you. That's because we don't allow them to have a bit of voice. Now, it's not to say that they can be treat you with disrespect or not courteous but they can have a voice. And we'll talk about this in just a few moments. There'll be a, a clear slide that will actually identify this. Praise more, criticize less. We can easily find their faults. We're very good at that. 
but you have to catch them doing the right things. Catch them doing the good things, the preferred future. Hey, I really like the way that you and your, your sister play today. Just, just makes me really proud to be your mum and dad. Really like that. And you know what? When we went to the shops today, you know, you didn't ask for anything. You know, it just, it just makes me feel really good knowing that you're... <laughs> it just makes me feel really good. It makes me feel really good. And I'm really proud that you're, you're, you're not like those other kids throwing those tantrums. And as, fact, as a fact, as a reward, I'd like to give you something. But what tends to happen, the kids throw a tantrum, we reward them for bad behavior and we give them the, the, the lolly, we give them the, the phone, we give them, we reward them for their bad behavior. We should be reward for them. That type of reward, the one that gives them for that throwing a tantrum to control so they're not, you know, no one's looking at you any further, is what I call a bribe. A bribe is not a reward. It's just a manipulation to get what you want. And guess what they've done? They're getting what they want. See how we're training them up in the way that they should go? If we allow it, they will go with it. So we need to change the directory of where they're going. All right. This is a big one. Who are, how many control freaks are there? You can take the photo now. This is the last of this slide. All right, just letting you know. Okay. How many control freaks here? No control freaks. Okay, just a few. All right. How many of you like those tidy rooms? Really, really tidy. Um, okay. If your child makes their bed, do you go and tidy it for them? Okay. Thank you for your honesty. Or your friend just dubbed you in. I don't know which one. Don't do things that they can do for themselves. This starts from a very early age. My two-year-old, my two-year-half-year-old grandson, he can pick up the plot blocks. He doesn't want to pick up the blocks. Who's going to win? I don't want to pick up the blocks. So I can make a bit of a game with it. Okay, Judah, we've got 25 seconds to pick up all the blocks. Are you ready? Set, yeah, go. And then we picked up all the blocks together. We did it together. We worked. That's my preferred future. I don't have to say, pick up the blocks. No, pick up the blocks. No, pick up the blocks. No, oh, okay, I'll do it for you. It's easier, it's quicker, more efficient, but you're teaching them a lesson. The lesson is, I don't want to do anything. The world's really revolving around me. I don't want to pick up the blocks. It takes work. I'd rather play games. I'd rather do what I want. So you need to start doing things that only you can do and they can start doing it for themselves, which means don't make their beds, don't make their lunches at the age of about eight to nine. You can. Don't do all their homework, which I really do enjoy doing homework. <laughs> the grade five Sovereign Hill project, I got three A pluses in a row for all my boys. I did, I, I have to admit, I, this is a confession, don't tell anyone else. Don't tell anyone else, all right? I'm just putting in the online people. All right, I did a little bit too much work because I got very competitive. They were outstanding works of art. But what did I do? I took over and not gave them the responsibility that they can do, they should do. Uh, my wife is, you know, a, a recovering control freak. She's got medication. She's working really, really well. But, you know, we decided to not buy dunas with stripes because stripes have to always be straight. When the boys so get block colors, you know, like you don't, you can't say, because what you're doing, if you go in and tidy up their room, you're sending two messages. One is, I'm never going to be good enough. And two why bother in the first place? Because mum or dad is going to come tidy it up in the first place. So you're, you're not giving them the incentive. You're not giving them preferred future. Their expectations is that they can do it. Now, it's never going to be perfect, but it's what the lessons you're teaching them for the long term. They have to take responsibility for their 
if they don't get their homework done, if they don't remember their runners, if they forget their lunch, there are responsibility, there are consequent, natural consequences for their poor choices. I did hear one podcast said this. Um, if you got a child that's, uh, you know, let's say a 12 year old, say, this is 12 year old, and doesn't want to go to school, doesn't want to go to school. This is, this is the example they gave. So you can take this or leave it. Doesn't want to go to school, but the other kids are ready to go to school and the kid's still in bed and, you know, you can't, you just, you, you're giving up and you're grappling with them, grappling with them. You know what they said, this, the, the guy on the podcast said, he goes, you know what, just take the other kids to school and let the 12-year-old discover that you've left. You'll find that when you get home, and, you, and this may not be appropriate and it's not always convenient, but it will teach them a valuable lesson. You know, and it is convenient, inconvenient because you have to take them back to school because when they wake up and they are not, everyone's gone, you can leave them a note and say, well, you weren't ready. They will learn the next time because otherwise they have to face the consequences. They have to ring up the school to say, I'm running late. Here's the reasons. I thought, this is so good. We never had that problem with our boys. Our boys were very good. But I, I know a lot, of, a lot of students at this time are very reluctant participants for a variety of reasons post COVID. So I, I take that in consideration, but I think it was, it, it sent a valuable lesson. They have quickly learned that you were serious and they're facing the consequences of their choices. So another couple of things of building relationships with your kids, um, put your eyes on as a child, see from their perspective. Honestly, this is something that we, we as adults, we can actually go and we think that they understand how the world works, but they don't. We think they know how to make friends, but they don't. How to encourage another one, they don't. They just don't know how to do it. So see yourself from their perspective and take yourself back. And then actually, that's a really good thing. So when you have a, you're grappling with your 16 year old and you may not have many 16 year olds here, but if you're grappling with your 16 year old and you could say, you know, when I was 16, I, I did the same thing for you, what, what you've done. I wasn't proud of it, but I understand. I understand, which means you're validating their experience. You're actually understanding and you can say, it must be tough. They are dealing with things through their perspective. If they break up with their best friend at school or something, whatever, for whatever reason, and you're saying, oh, just, it's, it's, it's okay. Don't. And you diminish their experience, they diminish their hurt, they diminish their grief, you diminish what they're going through. You're not seeing it from the perspective, you're not validating, but you can say, look, it must be really tough. It must be really difficult. And I feel for you. I understand this may, may make you angry or it may frustrate you. It's not dismissing their feelings. It's actually validating. It's actually coming alongside them rather than dictating them. Does that make sense? It's such an important thing. Listen, again, without judging and correcting. Sometimes we judge, we come to our own conclusions, and we're only seeing it from our point of view, not their point of view. Another couple of things. We have life experience and we can give advice, but don't always give it. Only offer it and you say, look, would you like a word of advice? This is from my experience. And they might say, no, I've got this. I can do it myself. Okay, I'm going to back off. Because you want them to start troubleshooting. You want them to be more responsible. You want them to actually face the consequences of either their poor choices or even when life does hit them with road humps and difficulties and challenges. If you come in and swoop in the helicopter, swoop in or make the lawnmower or the drone parent, whatever it is, and not allow them to face the consequences of whatever decisions they have, we're actually doing them a disservice. So now you can actually take a photo if you wanted to. The last two here. Life can be so full, so busy so full of other things to do. And in fact, I have to say, the church can become a busy place. There's so many activities. There's so many things you can do. I would have to say that if the church becomes um, a higher priority, and I'm saying the church, not God, I'm saying the church, 
and it's jeopardizing family time, then I think there's a disconnect because it's God first. God first, your relationship with God, then family, and then the other activities that come along. Now, it's not to say that you can't combine the two. In fact, it's actually great to do things together. When I was a kid's pastor, you know, my kids all became leaders. They all became, they were always there anyway to pick up or set up and things like that. But we could do things together. But you need to actually prioritize your time because basically for a kid, love is spelled T-I-M-E. Like you cannot get enough quality time and quantity time. You can't come up to your child and say, I've got five minutes. Tell me your hopes and dreams. Go on, tell me. It doesn't work that way. It means you're spending that quality time and that quantity time. It's kicking the soccer ball or shooting some hoops or doing activities that you like to do together and having some fun and memorable moments. And, and then you might find that your child will come up with this weird and wonderful, deep and meaningful question that if you just said, tell me, tell me what's on your mind. Tell me what's hurting you. What's, they won't do it but we're in the car driving and actually it's really good for boys to be in a car driving somewhere. Cause you don't have to look at, look at me, look at me, look at me. The kids are, they don't do it like that. And to be there fully present because we can be there physically, but we're not there emotionally and relationally there. That's how you film those build relationships. So we're coming up to the ones that everyone, the whole thing's coming up to this, this time here. That's as close as I could get to a rod, all right? <laughs> this is not in the Bible. Spare the rod, spoil the child. That's, that's a, 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 it's actually from an English um, play. I don't know, it's 1600s or something like that. I can't remember exactly. And that came from this play. The words that spoil the rod, spare the rod, spoil the child. Ultimately, there is an aspect of that. But we have to look at it from what the Bible talks about, the rod. The rod was seen as a, um, a thing to control. A shepherd would control the sheep. He would actually guide the sheep. If the sheep went astray, he could he, he nudge them. He didn't actually beat the sheep with it. He would guide them. Where we do get this, and everyone loves this verse, and there's actually a few more verses in Proverbs that talks this. Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him diligent to discipline him. So we think, okay, that gives me an excuse to use a rod. Now that's been, you know, used as a, a paddle, a shoe, a belt. It's not what the verse is actually talking about. It's actually saying the rod, and it's not a rod, it's the rod. The rod refers to a guidance. It's a teaching. It's a tool for discipline. It's a tool for discipleship. It's a tool, not an object. It's probably more of a verb rather than a noun. Now, in our culture today, and everyone wants to know what the answer is. Unfortunately, in our culture today, smacking has been outlawed and it's illegal. It's, and, and I cannot emphasize that enough. That your child would only have to say something to their, um, a teacher at school to say, my mum and dad smacked me last night. That teacher would be legally obligated to maybe make a report about you. I'll let that sink in for a moment. That's what the law says. Now, what does it mean from a Christian point of view? Now, did I smack my children growing up? Yes, I did. Would I smack them now? Probably. But I wouldn't do it very often. And it would always be a teaching moment. Now, my wife would have been probably the bigger disciplinarian, but we would never do it in anger. It was always in love. And it was to, in some respect, it was to break their will, not because they were, they ticked, me, ticked us off. It was because we were shaping and guiding them. But there are other, are other ways to use the rod to guide them, to shape them, to mold them. 
Now, I wish I could say to you wholeheartedly that I'm going to shift the needle that you will never smack your children again. Because the evidence, the research would say, children do not benefit from smacking. And, and all the evidence, both Christian um, and secular, would say the long-term effect of a child that you smack is not producing the desired outcome. So hopefully that may shift the needle. I, as I said, I would probably do a lot of other things different now that with more knowledge, more skills, more abilities that will I smack my grandchild? Probably never, ever. I've got other skills to do to deal with these things. Now, at the time, I thought it was the best, but I have seen, and again, if you ever smack a child, make sure that you are in control. Don't do it impulsively. Never, ever smack a child on their face. Never, ever, 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 ever. And, and I have to say, I've seen it happen in the Asian culture or here on the Asian culture, but that actually happens more often than not. Remove yourself, calm yourself down, and you might find that you may not necessarily have to smack them. But if you did it impulsively, remember, it more as a punishment, it's not discipline. It's a punishment. So here are some other forms of discipline that will make, may give you some other areas that you could do. The first one is technology. Obviously, you can use that as your preferred thing because kids love their technology. We use it as a reward. Don't use it as a bribe anymore. You're never, ever going to use that as a bribe, okay? But technology is one big thing. The other thing is, and these all start with T, by the way. Trust is another thing as your kid's getting older. I trust you. But if you break my trust, it's going to take a lot longer to earn my trust. Once a child's had trust and it's removed from them, it's, I am so sorry. I didn't mean to. I know I should have been home by 12 o'clock. And I know you said that and you should have, I should have called you. But I, didn't, I said, look, next time you ask me to go out, I can't trust you. It's going to take a while for you to earn that trust that conversation will have far greater result rather than the punishment you sent out. Does that make sense? Because we use our talking and allow thinking time, thinking time from both, but also talking. So help me understand. Do you think that throwing a tantrum is going to make me change my mind? Help me understand why you think that will work. You're yelling at me. You're talking about, you know, you want, you want me to drive you to the shops now? Help me understand that by you yelling at me, it's going to get what you want. I think you need to actually, let's take a time out, remove ourselves for a while, let's cool down, and let's see if we can do this, approach this a little bit differently. You see how the outcome, my tone, my volume, my response, I'm not really reacting because guess what? If your child yells at you and if you yell at them, guess what they do? They yell louder and then you yell louder. And then we have this yelling match and no one hears anyone. So it's a conversation. I can do this with my two and a half year old grandson. It must be really frustrating not getting what you want. What's another way we could do this? All right, you can throw a, you can throw a tantrum right now. It's not going to change my mind. Let's calm down. Now, what do you want from Pa? Again, I'm in control. I'm, I'm the authority here. Well, I'm learning to respond, not react. Because if this two-year-old gets what they want, they've actually won the, the battle. So it's a battle of wills. Hopefully, this gives you the timeout. And again, timeout, some, some books would say timeout doesn't work. But it, it's about a timeout for a one-year-old is one minute. A timeout for a two-year-old is two minutes. It's about one minute per age. It's approximate. And as they get older, it may be a little bit more. But a timeout is actually removing yourself. Now, it doesn't mean that they, you, you don't send, I'll give you an example. We gave our boys, when they were throwing wobblies, that they would go to the bathroom. We didn't send them to their rooms because their rooms were a haven. It's got the books. It's got their activities. It's got all those things. The bathroom, however, it's a bit cooler. 
the tiles. And if they were really disrespectful or did something, then they had to clean the bathroom. They quickly learned they didn't want to do that. But we remove themselves from an area that's not just so they can, because you can't say, send your kids to your room, especially if they like being by themselves. You send an extrovert to their room, that hurts. So remember, it's effectiveness of your punish or your discipline, not, and it's an age appropriate. Every child's different. What works with one doesn't work with other. Sometimes you'll see a kid, I don't care, take the technology away, it doesn't affect me. Well, maybe, maybe they need to have a time out. I, 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 I can sit here by myself all day long. Well, well, next time you want to do something, I, I don't care. I don't care if you trust me. Obviously, something's going on in your world, isn't there? Because this is not like you. Can you help me? What? Can you tell me what's going on? Because I remember when I was your age, I threw a wobbly like this to your grandparents, and and I remember I had something going on at school that was affecting me. Is there anything going on in your world? Yes. Do you see the different ways? Sometimes we need to come alongside them, put our eyes with their eyes, validate their experience. It must be very frustrating. It must be angry. I know you must be stressed at this moment. You must have a lot of over, overwhelming things. I come alongside them. I validate. I talk to them. I hear them. Don't dismiss them or diminish their, their, their reactions. It actually gets your attention. Because discipline allows children to develop self-discipline and helps them become emotionally, socially mature and secure adults. You could take a photo of that one as well. I'm coming into the landing and you can have some questions that may be able to answer a lot of these things. But as I said, this has been a really, I've really enjoyed preparing for this. There's so much rich content and I, I'm not doing it, dis, I'm not doing it as much, you could do so much more. And as I said, I could go to four hours. But uh, So our home, your home needs to become a haven because the world is trying to get them to think a different way, act a certain way, behave a certain way, all these things. Speak a different way. If I hear a kid say the word like, I feel like, does anyone, anyone have like, like? You know, they like I want to go to the toilet. I like I want to come with me. You like you. Uh, yeah. Um, your home is a haven. It needs to make people feel safe and secure. They can be themselves and they should be able to talk to you about anything and everything without you overreacting. And they should feel that this place called home is somewhere where I feel loved, cared for. I need to feel validated. I need to be feeling heard. Doesn't mean them they have an excuse to be disrespectful or discourteous or not contribute around the household. Remember, you need to give them, you, if they can do it, allow them to do it. May not be as good, but allow them. Anything that they can do, let them do. Because you're training them up for their future. Train up a child in the way that they should go. And when they are old, they will not depart from it. All of the biblical principles that God has sent about sparing the rod and the discipline. And, you know, obviously it's, a, it's, a, it's controversial, but I'm just saying from a, from a practical legal point of view, it's not to be done. If you do do it, be very careful. Never do it in anger. There are other ways to do things that you could do. My ultimate prayer for you is this, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Let me pray for you and then we'll do some Q&A. Father, I thank you so much that you are shaping us, molding us and disciplining us with love. We don't like it. It makes us feel uncomfortable. We know it will reap a harvest. And we pray, Father, for wisdom and insights for this 
group gathered and those online to hear this message, to help them in their incredible first voice privilege of being the primary disciples and disciplinarians of their children. Lord, I thank you for them and grant them a real sense of your peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, if you didn't get a chance, that, that QR code, if you wanted to, um, that was the one. But um, I'm going to open up for some Q&A um, if there's some questions that have come through. And I'm going to have a, a, a sip of water, and then, and then um, you can ask the question. Thanks so much, Brett. So there are two questions that we have had so far. Um, so the first one, Brett. 35 people, two questions. You've got all, you should have come and get a second question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, also, please send through more, and the number is over there if, um, if you haven't had a chance to um, uh, send through your questions. So the first one, Brett, is, is there any tips that you have when you are unable to follow through on the discipline or punishment you blurt out in a fit of anger? What, what are some strategies you could do? Um, we all fail. We all fail. This, I'm going to give this a, a bit of a broader topic because it's a great question. A broader aspect, we all fail, but we need to own it when we do fail. We need to apologize when we stuff up, when we've raised our voice, when we've done something out of anger. It makes our children feel safer that they can actually lose the plot. But then, and remember that discipline is a redemptive process. So next time you lose the plot or get angry, you can say, look, I am really sorry. I raised my voice. I said something that I shouldn't. Would you please forgive me? That lesson alone is worth gold. It's an incredible opportunity. There are times when it's not convenient, but it doesn't mean it's gone and forgotten. You might say, look, when we get home, we can discuss this. But now we're going to, you know, we're at grandma or grandpa's house or something like that. And your behavior was not great. And you know what we expect. We talked about this before we left, that nanny and pa don't like you running around their house and throwing things against the wall and spilling food on their carpet. We know that. You, we, just, we talked about that. That was the expectation. This is what we prefer, that you walk slowly in the house. If you have food, you stay in the kitchen. This is what we expected. We talked about this. So when we get home, we're going to discuss this, and there will be a consequences for your poor choices. But for now, we're at Nana and Pa's house. We're going to enjoy ourselves. And then we'll talk about it. So there are some times when you have to, you can't do it there and then. Most of the times for a child, a younger children, child, you need to do it there and then because their attention, they're, they're not going to remember what they did four minutes ago, never alone, you know, four hours ago. But when we do lose the plot, and it may be simply, if, you are, if you've got anger issues, let's just say, if you've got anger issues, it's probably more about you than the children. So I would start looking at, and we've actually got a couple of podcasts on anger, um, don't let anger control you. There's a two-part series. If you don't know where to find it, send me an email and I'll send you in the right direction. There are other things that you can do to help diminish your frustrations, your anger, your issues, but your children don't deserve to have them put onto you. Does that make sense? Hopefully that. Um, oh, I think I can just say it now. Okay. Um, so You've got to be in the camera because the people in Zoom were not oh. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, oh, thanks, Ed. how do I know? How do I know what would be the appropriate boundaries to the exposure of the sinful things of the world before I become overprotective of my children? Great question. Again, the fact is, you can't protect them, and you can't be there twenty four seven. Let's just use, for example, pornography. It's bad. It's, it's everyone knows it's bad, but yet. In 50% of um, men in church, the data would say that they're looking at pornography. And about 30%, 25 to 30% of women in churches are looking at pornography. We know it's bad, but we do it. Children, it's maybe curious, maybe accidental, maybe something like that. But we need to have those conversations. But we can't be their continual filter. We can put all the external filters on their on the computers and do all those right things but you need to encourage them to be have internal filters to be more discerning to divert their eyes to actually come up to you so for example if your child looks at pornography 
how you reacted to when you discovered that will determine whether they're going to tell you if it ever happens again. If you freak out, and, and my wife has given me permission. My wife discovered one of my sons was looking at pornography. Initially, she thought it was me. So that was a, another conversation, but it wasn't me. Um, and, she, and she overreacted. And so my son is already feeling guilt and shame. And then she just compounded that by her reaction. And I said, you can't do this. And then she apologized for her overreaction. She wasn't mad at him. She was mad at someone taking away his innocence. How we approach and protect them, we can't. We can't. We've got to empower them. We've got to trust them to make wise choices. Reason, what is reasonable behavior? What is because if we control everything, they're not going to own that. The more they own things, and that's where they, they can be count can be cross-cultural. You don't want to get you want to give them a certain amount of leash for one for a better word. When they're smaller, you can control the leash. But as they get older and more mature, the leash gets a bit further. But if they lose it, if they do mistake, then you have to bring it back again until they earn it again. We are developing and shaping the next generation to become the adults of the future. How you do that is not going to be helpful if you do everything for them. You can't protect them in a bubble. They're not in a bubble. So we need to actually give them a, a, a ways of doing that. Ways of um, asking new questions. Like they should be, and going back to, you know, your house should be a haven, a place where they can feel safe, a place where they can actually ask anything and everything. If you, if nothing's off taboo, then I mean, you, you don't, they can talk about sex. They can talk about drugs. They can talk about al alcohol. They can talk about uh, gender fluidity. They can talk about um, uh, same-sex attraction. They can talk about these things. If we don't talk about it, guess what they're going to do? They're going to go to their peers or they're going to go to the internet. And both of them haven't got the best advice. You do. So we should be able to talk about these things. And we at Focus, and there's plenty of other resources, are much more, will give you more confidence to having those conversations. So back to that original question, how can we protect them from the world? You can't. You can continue to shape them and mold them. But at the end of the day, and I use this analogy, and it's a great message that I heard, and this is something that you might be able to remember for the future. Moses' parents had to build a little bit of a, a, a basket, an ark, if you like. And they had to push it into the Nile, into the, the, the river. And they had to trust that they actually had built that ark, that little twig of a basket boat, as best they could. And then release Moses into the unknown. You are building an ark for your children to be released, or if you use that analogy, to shoot an arrow into the world, to make their mark, to be preparing for the world, shape it, and mold them. But at the end of the day, you can't control everything and you can do the very best you can do. And that's all you can do. Do your very best. Like what you say to your children, criticizing less, praising more, Praise effort, not results. If we're always looking out for the best, it's not going to work. But if you, act, did you do your best, great work. That's all you can do. And as a parent, you're doing your best. Making mistakes on your first child by the second and third, easy bubs. <laughs> and you're going to make mistakes on number two, three, four, and five. You're going to, because you, every child's different. Just when you think you've got it mastered, you have to continually be a student of your, of your children, just like you have to be a student of your spouse. Hopefully that gave a, a reasonable answer. Another question? Um, we actually have three more questions that just come through. Yep, so um, um, how do we correct our wrong res responses like giving them technology at inappropriate times now that our children expect that always, especially if they are young children? Yep. Um, shock them. Now, you could say, well, I'm going to do this slowly. You could say to your children, I went to a seminar today and he said, look, it's... <laughs> but it could be almost, and I, I may say jokingly, but it might be simply to say, look, I've been really challenged. So I probably haven't done the best parenting I could do. I've actually made it pretty easy in it. 
it may be uncomfortable for a while, but this is going to be our new reality. That's for a younger child. A bit more difficult for an older child, but if a younger child, you can shock them. For an older child, it might be saying, look, you know, you can have an argument with the child and say, look, get off your technology, but then you're on your phone all the time as well. Doesn't send the right message. You're a hypocrite. But you can trans, transfer it to some other things that we want to spend some family time. You know, I really miss you. You seem to be on your game device all the time. We just miss you. I was just wondering whether you could just maybe let's carve out one night a week that we could actually have, we can have family time. Let's have a games night. Let's go out and go for a walk. Let's go and do an activity. Let's create some memories together. But it's admitting that you haven't had it all together and you've made mistakes. That's a great place to start. And if you're feeling convicted, that's, that's okay as well. I don't mind feeling, making you feel convicted or even maybe a little bit uncomfortable because I'm here to help you navigate this highly technologically connected world, but we're so relationally disconnected. And we need to bring that back because we're relational beings. And we need to help develop emotional intelligence and the internet and technology screens are not helping develop emotional intelligence. So shock your kids and say, look, I know we're going to do this and um, we're going to have a technology-free period of time once technology-free technology Tuesdays or Fridays or weekdays or whatever you decide to do as a family. Maybe include your kids if they're a bit older in that decision-making process, but you'll find that if you've let, as the kids get older, if you've allowed them to get away with things, they will continue to do it. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. That's all the questions that we can go through for all this. Uh, well, there's three more, but I think we're running out of time. So, yeah. I will just say, just quickly, on our website, um, for, for those who um, got children under the age of about um, six, six, seven, um, this is called Good Pictures, Bad Pictures, how to talk to your kids about pornography. That's $20 um, if you'd like to have that. Um, then there's um, a, a Good Pictures, Bad Pictures for primary age kids from about eight to 12. It's, you get the kids to read it, you read it with them, and um, it's great conversation starters, Good Pictures, Bad Pictures. It's on our website. And something we've just produced, it's, um, it's called Daddy's Bedtime Prayer. There's one for boys and one for girls. And so it's a little devotional that you can read with your kids to pray over. So they're $10. Um, and the, you can fill in their kid's name and that become that regular thing that you can do with your son or daughter. So they're $10. Um, take, so those people who have already taken a book, you have to give it back until you pay for it. Um, but the other, <laughs> there's the thing, um, there's a couple of brochures there about family casts, a little bit more about focus on the family and, um, and then the family cast series that I've said, um, a whole bunch of videos. So that's all for me. And um, I think that's the last you can take it from there. Thank you so much, Brett, Brett, Brian, everyone.